Um, we are continuing with our, our testify. Um, first off, I want to say welcome. It seems like forever since I've seen a lot of you. Brittany's not back yet. She, uh, she took her kids over. But, uh, Brittany is back. Um, I thought TJ was going to be here today, but I guess he didn't make it in yet. Um, but TJ is back in town. He will be with us sometime over the next couple of weeks. Uh, a lot of you guys have been gone with different things, softball and summer activities, and welcome back to this And it's good to have our visitors here, too. Um, so anyway, back to our testify thing. Today I have asked Kayla if she would come up and share her testimony. So, Kayla, I'm turning it over to you. So I'll probably just be reading off my notes that I don't have to do or can be cheap. I grew up in a house with Christian parents, so you kind of have sort of an idea of what kind of foundation I had. Um, I went to church, to Sunday school, and I learned from both my parents and my Sunday school what was right and wrong, the Ten Commandments, just the basics. Um, I learned about God, that He's perfect, and that He's all-knowing and all-powerful. Most importantly, I learned that He loves me a lot. Um, he wants me to be with Him so much that He sent His Son that I might have a choice um, to die for me. Uh, that I might have a choice to believe in Him and follow Him. Or not to and have to pay my own price. I learned that God is the best person to place my trust in and to take care of me and, well, He knows what's best for me. So when that finally sunk in and I had a good understanding of what that entailed, I made the choice to accept Jesus as my Savior. I was nine years old at the time, and shortly after that I uh, made a proclamation of faith by being baptized in the freezing river in Hamilton, Montana, <laughs> in October. <laughs> um, I was baptized by the pastor of our church, but I was also blessed to have my dad there with me to baptize me as well, so that was very special. And as I grew up, I continued to feel more and more of a desire to be pleasing God and, and wanting to be pleasing in His sight. Um, if you get to know me a little bit, you'll probably know what it's like to be a people pleaser. Um, I want to please my mom and dad, my family, my friends, my peers. Um, but I do have one other big problem, and that is I am also a self-pleaser. So baby step by baby step, I've had to ask God to help me to open my hands and give him my pieces to myself so that I will hang on to them and keep them myself, but to just give all to him. Um, and he's helped me with that, as well as with some things that I knew I had, but I just didn't to give up. He's helped me overcome a number of my fears, of which I'll only list a few of them. Um, he's helped my husband and I as we pursued an opportunity for a job in Folsom when we got newly married. And, um, fearing, not knowing where we were going to be staying, he led us to a home in a town where a rental agent told us good luck on finding a place because we were two months late out of the rental season. But he provided a home for us, and it was just perfect. He also brought us back when we prayed for opportunity to be with our families again. And he's helped me overcome my fear of becoming a parent, which so far is not as bad as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> um, he's turned my nervousness and my sheer panic of teaching young children at Sunday school into a joy and a pleasure, which I will, Joe, be doing again once I have my little one taken care of. <laughs> um, he's taken my anxiety that I have always had around being with teenagers. <laughs> and now, as I know he has a sense of humor, I am a leader at our youth group and help with them. And then the last one, which I'm currently battling, is public speaking. <laughs> <laughs> of which Dad popped on me last night. <laughs> and watch your stress off. Yeah. 
<laughs> so I told him at 11 o'clock last night as my printer decided not to work for my notes and being one that likes to be organized, he was kind enough to print these for me. <laughs> I take comfort in remembering that God really does know what's best for me, more so than anybody else. I know I can trust him as I let go of my limited wisdom and to his omniscient wisdom and be filled with peace. A piece that I know I could only have with him. And there's a verse to a song that I often hear on the radio, which really reminds me of this. And I'm not going to sing, because that's another one I have not gotten over yet. <laughs> uh, but the verse goes, I'm going to fix my eyes on all that you are, till every doubt I feel deep in my heart grows strangely dim. Let all my worries fade and fall to the ground. I'm going to seek your face and not look around till the place I'm in grows strangely dim. Strangely, strangely dim. hockey tournament weekend and uh, we have a tradition that after <coughs> the first day we get together at Taco Bell. <laughs> That's not a tradition I care for. <laughs> but we were there and, and Kayla was uh, eating and I said, hey, you want to give me a testimony tomorrow? And she choked. <laughs> and gave me dirty look. <laughs> thanks for the warning, Dad. I said, well, I don't want you to stress out. So, you know, scripture says be ready in season and out. He says, I think this is an out season. <laughs> oh, you're still supposed to be ready. So, thank you, Kayla. Um, Heyday! Vacation Bible School is coming up. Um, Joe? Yes. Which of these was I supposed to hand out? Both of them? Both, if nobody has received them or take them for their friends or neighbors or... Hopefully their neighbors are their friends. <laughs> <laughs> or an opportunity to become friends. Okay, so I have, what are these? The one of them says registration form. The one is the registration form. One just explains it, and the other one is just okay. like a pre-registration. So, if you don't have any idea what AA is, put your hand up, and I'm going to give you one of these sheets of paper. Because you might have neighbors that may or may not be friends. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Okay, so. I gave you two. You need three. What is this? I haven't given the registration form yet. This is just the what it is form. Um, I've been looking over the material that Joe has pulled together for the, the Vacation Bible School, and I'm not a fun person, because you got to dance and sing and be happy, and she put me in charge of PR. <laughs> well, all i got to do is, is go hang up posters, and I, I don't have to dance, thank God. Um, if you would like... Registration forms. I'm going to put them up here. Please come up and get one. This will just let us know, kind of give us an idea, how many to prepare for. Okay, this is the first time we've done Vacation Bible School in how long? It's never been done since I've been here, I don't think. Do you know, have we ever done one? I mean, I know we participated with one of the other churches, but... Well, we did, but I was with like a real time. Okay, so it's been a long time. <coughs> You mean a real young child? <laughs> so, registration forms are up here. Um, we are continuing in Colossians. Surprise, surprise. We are blazing away in chapter 1. Start 
reading in, in verse 19. Um, last week we, we took a week off and we, well at least I hope we blessed our fathers for Father's Day. Uh, this week we're back into Colossians, so in verse 19 I'm going to start reading it. It says, For in him, being Jesus, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross, by the blood of his cross. And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above, above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now I know this is going to be hard to believe, but it is my goal to get through this whole section. That's like four verses. Restrain your awe. <laughs> I had to back up. You know, the last time we talked, we talked about um, the deity of Christ. But I, I wanted to back up because, see, this, this passage that we're dealing with, 21 through 23, doesn't really make sense unless you look at it in light of what came before. Okay, so the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in Jesus. So Jesus is the fullness of God. Okay, he's not god light. He's not like God <coughs> Jr. He's just God. Okay. Now, and we need to have a firm understanding that the, the, the triune nature of God is that there are separate parts that are equal. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And I don't understand the whole dynamic. I think this is a mystery that God has left in place. For whatever reason, He created our brains too small to firmly grasp this. Okay? But Jesus is fully God. And when He walked on this earth, he was fully God. Okay, so we got we got we got to understand that. Okay, so he's fully God, and through him, through Jesus, to reconcile to himself all things. Now that that statement, I, I touched on this a little bit last time, but I want to point out the direction that this reconciliation is going. Okay, he reconciles to himself. See. In this disagreement between humanity and God, God is the offended party. God is the one upon whom the offense has been given. Man is the one that gave the offense. See, mankind doesn't reconcile God to himself. God has not reconciled himself to mankind because God did no wrong. God was perfect. Okay? Man is the one that committed the error. Okay? Um, that would be Somewhat like someone coming into your house and stealing your possessions. Getting caught, going to jail. And you going to jail and bailing them out. That's kind of the idea here. Okay? Why in the world would you bail out the person that offended you, that stole your stuff? But we go even beyond that. That would be like somebody come and murdering your child. And you going to jail and bailing them out. See, this, this is the nature of the offense before God. Okay, so the direction that this goes is not God to us. It is us to God. Jesus, <coughs> then again, through him to reconcile to himself all things. And you can also understand that that's saying, again, it's reiterating the divinity, the deity of Jesus Christ. The offense is to God, so why is he reconciling it to himself if he's not God? Did you pick that up? Jesus is God. He said, I, I've got to make a way for this thing to happen. Okay? Again, the triune nature of God I don't fully comprehend, but Philippians tells us that Jesus, being in nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Instead, he took upon the nature of a slave. Okay? So, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, God the Son came to a conclusion. God the Son came down to reconcile to himself lost mankind. Right? 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 right. right. Boy, you get a lot quiet. 
Okay. So all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. Now, that phrase, whether on earth or in heaven, quite honestly, I've read a lot of different uh, what people think about this. My, my feeling is those that are living and those that are dead. Okay? Okay? Because you understand that when Abraham died, he didn't go to heaven. He couldn't go to heaven yet because there wasn't a way. You know, Jesus tells a parable of Abraham's bosom. All right? The rich man and Lazarus, you know, they both die. Lazarus goes to Abraham's bosom where he's comforted. I said you're rich man. Lazarus goes to Abraham's bosom. All right? That's what I said, right? Okay. All right. Okay. Lazarus is in Abraham's bosom. I'm not saying you're the good guys and you're the bad guys. Abraham's bosom, the fiery side, which is not. Okay? So we believe that there was a holding place for a time until the, the work of Jesus was accomplished. Okay? They, they are saved by the faith that they exhibited in the Jesus to come. We are saved by the faith that we exhibit in the Jesus that has come. Right? Okay? So, quite honestly, this, this to me, you know, I've heard people, I heard some, I even read some that said, oh, you know, this proves that there's going to be reconciliation for the fallen angels. No. No, because in order to make that work, you have to black out so many other passages of Scripture that, that it just doesn't bear witness. Okay? There's no, there's no salvation for the fallen angels. There's a pit created for them that is called hell, and they will be cast into it. Okay? So, making peace by the blood of his cross. It always comes back to the blood. Okay? It always comes back to the blood. We like to think of salvation as this pure, crystalline, kind of white, glowing, ethereal, lovely thing. And, and in an aspect it is, but the, the, the cost of salvation always comes through the blood. Okay? You know, I hated the song I heard when I was a kid that talked about the blood of the cross and, you know, the blood coming down on me and stuff like that. I don't like it. Okay. Um, that's one of those things where my kids start screaming. My first thought is, oh, I hope it's not blood. <laughs> my second thought is, oh, I hope it's not a snake. <laughs> okay. Blood I can deal with better than a snake. But um, I, don't, I, I just have never really liked blood. But see, that's the cost that was, was paid on our behalf. The, the whole cost. Pouring out his life, the shedding of his blood unto death. So, making peace by the blood of the cross. That's, that, to me, that doesn't make a lot of sense because in my finite mind, in my limited world view, that would be like me and my brother getting into a fight and I make peace by punching him in the nose. <laughs> enough so that it would bleed. <laughs> yeah, you know, that doesn't work. It doesn't work. Okay? There is no peace. If I get in the fight for a moment until he gets the blood stopped, okay, then the fight will just continue on later. Okay? That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But in God's economy of things, this is what was needed for us to be restored to Him, for us to be reconciled, shedding the blood. Okay? Now, all of that said, that's not what we're talking about. Today. But you have to understand that to understand what we're talking about today. Okay? Um, verse 21. We have to have an understanding of our position before God to understand our need for the cross, to understand the salvation that's offered to us. Okay? And Paul, in just these few verses, actually in this verse right here, he's going to lay out something before us that, that is necessary for us to understand our salvation. Okay? And you, that being us, all of mankind, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. See, Paul is writing this letter to Christians, to believers, to people that have already made a profession of faith. Okay? So, he says, and you who once were. Okay, that, hopefully, that is every one of us in this room. Okay, who once were. But do you, do you see what he says here? Alienated. Okay? Now, I, I looked this up. And the, the word literally means 
we were estranged and shut off from. Okay. Now, alienated is a word that you, it's not infrequent that you hear it. It's not, you know, ever unspoken. But to, but to really understand what it means is, that, you know, um, if I were to ask Josh, Josh, go over there. Go ahead, go. You're our example for today. You'll go out the door and pull it close behind you. Now, Josh has been shut off from us. Okay? Now that, that's just a, a solid four door. It's not that big a deal. I mean, the handle works. You can just turn it and open it and come on through. Go, come on back, Josh. See, that, that doesn't work. Okay. But the wall, the, the separation that divided us from God was unreachable by us. Okay? We have been removed and shut off from God. We no longer had access to Him. Remember in, in the garden, God came and walked with them in the cool of the evening. They had face-to-face -face fellowship. God desired fellowship. God wanted to be with them and talk with them. I mean, think about that. God chose to remove himself from the throne of heaven to come down and walk in the cool of the evening. And when he couldn't find them, what did he do? No, oh, I guess they're not home. I'm going back to my throne. No. God said, Adam, Adam, where are you, Adam? He went looking for them. Okay? God, since the fall of man, has looked and looked and looked for you. The wall is there. The door has been made by the blood of Christ. Okay? So, we have been shut away. But then it goes on and further and it says, um, and hostile in mind. Okay? Now, hostile, it means hateful, odious, enemies of God. This same word is used to describe Satan. Okay, like arch enemy of God, Satan. Okay, so th this same word is used to describe us. Hostile in mind. The, and the mind, the word for mind there, it's the thinking part of you. The part of you that, that thinks, or, or sometimes doesn't think, it just does. And then thinks about it later, oh, that was stupid. Okay? So, the nature of this thing is, at the fall of man, we not only became estranged from God, we're enemies of God, but where our thoughts are hateful toward God. James chapter 4 tells us that friendship with the world is enmity toward God. Or hatred toward God. See, that's one of my biggest astounding things about the church in America today. I read a report... It was either Friday night or yesterday morning. I can't remember. Um, the Exodus Project. Does anybody know about the Exodus Project? It's a, it's a ministry that is to uh, homosexual people. To restore them. To help them out of their sin. Okay? Just like we have ministries to alcoholics and drug users. To... Uh, Users of different types, uh, of people with different sexual sins. It's a ministry that was was developed and put into place. It's been around for I think almost 30 years. They've closed their doors, and the president of that ministry issued an apology to the gay and lesbian community for how long they were. I'm sure he made a lot of friends in this world. See, um, homosexuality is a sin like every other. Okay? And, and like every other sin, we seek to find ways to accommodate our sin. Hopefully, we, maybe we can just make our sins acceptable. But see, God says, no, no sin is acceptable. None of them. You know, that's one of the things I've never understood. I've been in churches 
where if you smoke a cigarette, you're not allowed to be an elder or a deacon. But man, if you're fat, you're in. See, I, I don't understand that because the scripture says gluttony is a sin. God despises gluttony. But I don't see much said anything about cigarettes. That's a cultural thing. That's a cultural sin, if you will. A sin is sin is sin, guys. God hates it all. Okay? Um, so, I, I, James tells us that a friendship with the world is enmity toward God. So, or, or hatred toward God. Now, do you recognize the value, the importance of what he's saying here? Okay? Don't confuse this with this separation mentality. You know, this fortress mentality. Where, oh, we're the saved ones! They're not! Build a wall so we'll maintain separation. It's just us and you, God. <laughs> I've seen that. I've seen that. Oh! Corrupted by them. Listen, corruption comes from the inside, not the out. Okay? Remember when the Pharisees were griping at Jesus because they ate without washing their hands? And he laughed at them and he said, What are you talking about? It's what's inside that makes you dirty. It's not what's outside and goes in, it's what's inside and comes out. He even uses some graphic language in, in describing the process, the natural process of getting rid of the stuff. <laughs> Okay? Jesus didn't pull any punches. He wasn't delicate. Okay? We want Christians to be delicate. Jesus wasn't delicate because he told it like it was. Okay? The world needs to hear it like it is. Okay? We speak the truth in love. You have to have both, people. you got to love them enough to tell them the truth. Okay? Uh, you know, I've, I've got a brother... Scott, if you're watching, this is you. All right? He has a hard time with speaking the truth in love. He has no problem speaking the truth. You're a sinner, you're going to hell. Have a good day. Okay? I, I tend to be somewhat the opposite of my brother. Oftentimes, I don't want to offend them, I don't want to hurt them, so I, I have the truth and sometimes make it so vague that they're, they walk away going, I think that guy's retarded. <laughs> he didn't even get a straight sentence out of his mouth. Okay? We have to have both. We have to love them enough to tell them the truth. You think Jesus just enjoyed bashing the Pharisees and the religious leaders? Because sometimes I, I read this word and I think, man, he went out hunting them. The word of Pharisees. <laughs> John, check this out. No. <laughs> Really, doesn't it look, read that way sometimes? Come on. Am I the only one that saw that? Okay. But really, you know what really I think is happening? Because see, see, that's that's putting Glenn into Jesus instead of putting Jesus into Glenn. Okay, because if I was Jesus, that's what I've been doing. If I had all of that at my command, I'd be like, John, check this out. <laughs> so, Pharisee, what do you think? Yeah. It would not be good. See, thank God we've got to do the reverse and Jesus has to come into the news. Okay? Because what he was doing was he was so very desperately trying to save them from their own self-righteousness. Okay? He was desperately seeking to save them from their religiosity. We've got all the answers. We have Moses as our father. We have Abraham as our father. I think, I think Jesus wept more over the Pharisees and the religious leader than he did over all the sinners combined. Because, see, they had it. They had everything they needed to know who he was and why he was there. They, of all people, should have been embracing him the most, just like us. We, of all people, should have been embracing him the most. And they fell back on their letters on their teaching that gave them a sense of superiority and importance. See, Jesus went out and ministered to the world. I mean, he went to Matthew's house. 
a tax collector. And there were sinners in there. And the Pharisees would come up to the door and look. And Peter. Why is he in there? I thought he was a righteous and a holy man. Oh. What did Jesus say? What did Jesus tell them? I have come to heal the sick. The healthy have no need of a doctor. Okay. Was Jesus befriending the world? Was Jesus befriending the world? No. Because there was no compromise in his testimony, in his word. He went in there to tell them that he had life. And that they were bound in death and they needed to be set free. I don't understand churches that accommodate the world. I don't understand. I had a conversation last week and <coughs> some people that we hold very dear are attending a church that is not a church. It's a social gathering. They were pleased to announce that their church was open and liberal that their associate pastor was a homosexual and was married. <clears throat> and they left a church where they would get together and study the Bible and went to a church where they go to museums and have wine tasting classes. See, that's friendship with the world. And, and that sets you as an enemy to God. You know? Hey, world, you want to be buddies? You know, you can't egg someone that's been rolling around in the mud without getting muddy. You can get that on you. And the church has been called to be separate. You know, the, the Bible calls us a peculiar people. We're strange. That makes me feel so good. Because I know I'm strange. Okay, my kids will tell you I'm strange. I do weird things. My daughter all the time, she goes, she goes, Cat, you're weird. You got that G in you too. I understand that. That, that verse gives me hope. Oh, yay! There's a reason I'm weird. Okay? But see, if it looks like the world and talks like the world and smells like the world, you can't call it a Christian. Okay? So, this is what we once were. Going back to our verse here. Alright? So, doing evil deeds. Doing evil deeds. Now, think about that for a minute. What is an evil deed? <coughs> do, you, do you know what he's actually saying here? He's not saying, you know, like you went out and murdered people. Oh, that's, that's an evil deed. Yeah, so if you did that, you've done an evil deed. Talk to me after church. <laughs> okay? An evil deed here, what he is referring to is anything that is outside of the will of God. Okay? Anything that sets itself in opposition to God. Like living and pleasing yourself. That, that would be one of those things. You know? Like looking out for number one. Whatever that would be. Because there's all different kinds of things. Okay? Doing evil deeds. Okay. Now, this translation, I don't really, this part I don't like. I like the NIV. Does somebody have the NIV? Yeah. Real quick. I want you to read, um, starting with doing evil deeds in 21, and read uh, the, the next, I'm sorry. <coughs> oh, okay, it's my glasses. Um, the first part of 22. So the end of 21 and the end of 22. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled ah. you by Christ. Catch that? I love that word. But now. See, this, see this isn't, if this were the end of the story, man, we could all go home and just cry. But that's not the end of the story. Okay? See, if that was the end of the story, this would not be called the gospel, the good news 
It would be called the Bummer Book. <laughs> okay? But it's called the Gospel for a reason. But God, but now, He has reconciled in His body of flesh by His death. Why did Jesus have to come in the flesh? I don't know why God does what He does sometimes. I don't know why He didn't just go, bing, and make it all better. But God plays by the rules He set into effect. We think that it's harsh for us. He plays by those same rules and it cost Him His Son. Okay? He was subject to the very rules he put into place. And seeing that we could not accomplish what was necessary to accomplish so that that sin would fall away from us, he sent his son. So he has reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. Okay? See, it, didn't, it wasn't enough just to be beaten, just to shed blood. It was to the death. Why? In order to present you holy and blameless, and above reproach before Him. Listen, people, this right here is a verse that gives us incredible hope. It also gives us something with which to do battle to the enemy. What is Satan known as? Father. The father of lies, the something of the brethren. Accuser. The accuser. Satan's job is to come in and tear you down. You are not good enough. Oh, that sin! You listen, thought, that thought. And I saw what you did. I saw that. You think in your way, you think God could love you because of that? You're wrong. That's a lie. He is the father of lies, and it is his job to accuse you of everything you've done and thought. Jesus accomplished much more than Satan can do. Read this again. In order to present you Holy, remember what holy means? Set apart. Okay? Set apart unto righteousness. You are no longer of this world. You've been pulled out. You've been set apart. You're unique. You're weird, just like me. Okay? And blameless. Remember when the Pharisees brought the woman to Jesus and they put her down in the dirt and said, this woman was caught in adultery. Jesus wrote in the dirt, and they started leaving one by one. Yeah, well, personally, I think he wrote the dates and times that they were with her. <clears throat> I got something in the oven. I, that, I, I don't know what he wrote, but that makes sense to me. Okay. When they had all left, what did Jesus say to the woman? Woman, where are your accusers? Who accuses you? She, she said no one. See, when we stand before God, we come before Him with the blood of Christ, we are blameless. We are blameless. There is no one to accuse us of anything. Okay? So, and above reproach before Him. Oh, man. See, I mess up a lot. I mess, I mess up every day. Lots of times every day. Okay? Things happen, I get frustrated, I get irritated, I think thoughts that I shouldn't think. Um, just last week, Christy and I got into a wham bang of a fight. I don't, I don't even remember what the fight was over. That wasn't the point. The point was to try and get us off our game. And of course we did. And then reconciled. And, and fix things back, okay? But see, we are above reproach. Do you know how valuable that is? How significant that is? That whatever sin you've committed in your life, you're above that now. You're not only blameless, but nobody looks down on you now because of that. Oh yeah, the world wants to look down on you because they want to pull you down with them. They're this self-same world that calls Christians reprobate for standing against progress and, and abortion. Yeah, they want you down with them. Any of you guys ever been mud wrestling? 
No, 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 I'm not talking about the bikini type. I'm just talking about wrestling in the mud and getting dirty. Okay, I know I'm the only one that had a real childhood here. Okay, but my brothers and I would wrestle in the mud. We wrestled everywhere. But man, if it was in muddy, that was just that much more fun. But I'll tell you what, not a single person stood there watching didn't get muddy. Because man, we looked up from the mud and we saw somebody clean standing there. Ah! What did we do? <laughs> That's right. We went after them and got them in the mud with us. All right? That is the world. They want you in the mud with them. They want you down and dirty like they are. He has reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy, set apart, unique, and weird, and blameless, without fault, with no accusation, being able to stick, and above reproach before him. Now here's the critical part of this. Okay? This is the part you have to get. <clears throat> if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now, Scripture says there are two things required unto salvation. What are they? Ephesians chapter 2. Look over there real quick. Ephesians chapter 2. says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not of your own doing, it is the gift of God. See, there are two things required in salvation. His grace, which is already there, and your faith that brings you personally into that salvation. Okay? Okay? Now, faith is not just belief. Alright? Because you understand, James also tells us that even the demons believe and they shudder. Okay? It's a faith unto change. Whatever change you would have of you. Unto action. Unto obedience. Because see, the scripture also tells us there are two things that are proof of your salvation. That are indicators. Okay? Matthew uh, chapter 12. Don't, don't turn there. I'll just read it real quick. Um... 12 verse 50 says, For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Okay? So, hold on to that thought for just a second because I'm going to back up. Matthew 7 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father. See, if you want to be a brother and sister of Jesus Christ, and that's, that's what salvation is, to become a brother and sister of Jesus Christ, there has to be obedience. There has to be obedience. Okay? That has to follow. Now, there are a lot of people that have obedience to this word that don't have salvation. Because they're trying to earn it. Look, God! I kept the Sabbath, mostly. I didn't kill anyone. Well, I thought a couple times about that one guy. You know, with the dog that came in my yard. You know. Mostly it wasn't him, it was his dog. Does that count? No, that doesn't. Okay, with the, you know, the, the, they're trying to earn their way. Go to Ephesians says what? What does it say again? Come on. And then the next part? Ah, now let's read the next verse. Let's read the next verse. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. See, you can't earn your way to heaven. That's what's so cool about salvation. And it's so hard about salvation. That's, that's what makes salvation difficult, believe it or not. We have a hard time just accepting the gift. Here it is, take it. 
You want me to mow your lawn for that? <laughs> Wash your car? How about a nice dinner? What, a nice loaf of bread? Cookies. What? What do you want me to do for that? Well, just take it. I can shine your shoes. You have any dogs? I can play pickup. We, we have such a hard time with that. Just accepting it. Okay? It's a free gift. But once it's there, obedience is required. Not obedience to earn it. It's yours. It's there. Take it. Okay? You're never going to impress God with what you've done. You just can't. He's done it all. You know that uh, been there, done that? Yeah, he's got like always there, always done that, created it to be done with in the first place. Okay? So you can't impress him. So the works, works aren't, they're not unto salvation. They come as a result of salvation. Okay? So obedience. There's something else that is required. Matthew 24, verse 13 says, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. See, that's what, what Paul is telling us in Colossians. See, he says, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. Okay? See, we're not in a sprint here. We're in an endurance race. And it's not just a marathon where you just run and run and run and run and run. It's like running a marathon. You know, let's, let's run the Boston Marathon during rush hour. That's what it's like. Because, see, the devil's out there driving that <coughs> bus, <laughs> taking out Christians left and right. <laughs> and you pick yourself up from that, and some dude on a scooter... <laughs> All right? That's what this is like. It's unto the end. Unto the end. Being steadfast. Not, it's not saying walking perfectly. Then we're all going to stumble. <coughs> we're all going to fall. That's the marvelous thing about His grace. See, that's the marvelous thing about His grace. Because, see, Paul also tells us where sin abounds, where there's sin, where there's sin, a lot of sin, there's grace even more. That's the marvelous thing about this. Is you can't out-sin God. You can't out-sin His grace. Okay? I, I, I can't believe you. The number, of, the, the number of people that have told me, oh, God could never forgive me of my sin. God, if you won't fall in His grace... See, I mean, you, 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 you may have an ocean of sin. He's got a universe of grace. Okay? Steadfast. Now, one last thing I want to share with you. And people are saying, okay, the, the, the eternal security question always comes into play here. So, what about those Christians that aren't steadfast and, and, and you know, they, they get hit by the bus and end up back on the sidewalks? 1 John tells us, chapter 2, verse 19, he says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might be complained that they were not all of us. See, that's the thing here. A lot of people come in the doors, a lot of people sit in the pews, a lot of people sing the songs, a lot of people pray the prayers that aren't of us. Okay? Pastors, get up and preach the word. Fall away because they were not of us. Elders, deacons, Sunday school teachers, regular old bench warmer Christians, fall away because they were not of us. Listen to me. It is my firm belief that salvation is for eternity. You can do nothing to earn it. You can do nothing to maintain it. Once God has given it to you, He has taken you in your hand, in His hand, nothing can shake you loose. Nothing. Nothing in all of creation. I've heard, uh, actually, it was in a discussion with someone that said, Oh, nothing can, but you can remove yourself so you're not created anymore. Because it says nothing in all of creation can shake them loose from His hand. But I will also tell you this. Many people make an emotional 
lip service confession in a time of need that never give their hearts to the Lord. You see, he doesn't say you accept him as Savior, he says you accept him as the Lord. Okay? We want him as Savior because that entitles us to eternity in heaven. I mean, who doesn't want streets of gold? But do we really want him as Lord that when he says go, you go? And when he says stop, you stop. See, that's the dilemma that faces the Christians today. And it's always faced Christians. You can't have him as Savior without having him as Lord. If you have him just as Savior, when things get rough, you will fall away because you are not his. You aren't his. Neighbor's kid. Neighbor's kid. There's lots of neighbor's kids sitting in churches across America today, across the world today. They are not his. <coughs> this grace is marvelous. It's free. It supersedes any sin in your life. But see, it comes at a cost because in order to receive it, <laughs> you gotta die. You gotta give it up. Okay? You have to lay down your life. And, and, and see, the silly thing about this is, is it's not like all of a sudden you become a slave. You're already a slave. You understand that? You're never your own master. You think you are, but you're a slave to what the world tells you, what the devil tells you. You're a slave to your passions. Quite honestly, we make stupid masters anyway. <clears throat> Who of us wants a parent that is completely uninvolved and uncaring about you and your life? Wouldn't you rather have a parent that doesn't want you to stick your face in the fire? I wouldn't do that. That's not a good... But, I mean, you know, you're, you know, you're two years old. You should know by now, so feel free. Yeah, it hurts, don't it? Okay. Wouldn't you rather have a parent that wants the best for you? Good for you and not harm? Wouldn't you rather have a parent that tells you, no, 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 don't, don't snort that mustard. That's going to hurt. <laughs> Wouldn't you rather have a parent that actually knew you were doing that before you did it and then came and stopped you? Because it did hurt. And don't ever let your brother bet you that you can't snort mustard. <laughs> it burns. Okay? I would rather have a parent that knew everything about me and loved me and told me, don't do that, that's going to hurt, stop. Than one that, if they knew what was going on, didn't care. 